Hi there, I'm Lillian. Welcome to my channel. Here I talk about what it's like to wake up one day and find yourself in a real life nightmare. You discover you're married to a covert narcissist. I talk about how I was baited through love bombing, trapped by a trauma bond, and stuck in blindness, unable to tell the difference between love and abuse for 34 years. Here I share my journey of how healing my feminine heart was the key to everything. I started to understand God in a whole new way, and His Word spoke to my heart in ways I didn't know that it could. I learned to understand myself better, why I struggled with self-confidence, and why predators were always drawn to me. But the most significant revelation was that a healed feminine heart can drive away darkness with light. Today I'm going to talk about anhedonia. It's part three of my other two videos on anhedonia, but it's also a Christmas special too. You can listen to part one and two where I share about the ex how the experience felt as I walked through losing my love for playing piano. When you're married to a wolf, that's always where you're going to end up. You're going to lose a love of all things that are you. So I've put the links for those two other videos in the description box. Generally, anhedonia is associated with depression and described as a loss of zest for life. Webster's defines it as a condition characterized by the inability to experience pleasure in normally pleasurable acts. The phrase normally pleasurable acts is what you need to remember because it's not just general life fun that everyone would normally enjoy. What happens is that you stop enjoying your normally pleasurable activities because abuse is tailored to you. It's not just a matter of, hmm, I don't think I like sewing anymore, oh, or I feel bored with piano. You cannot put your finger on it. You don't know when or how it happened, but you don't have any of your own pleasurable activities anymore because it's his pleasurable activities and only his that are now yours. So if you want to listen to more about that, you can listen to the other two parts. Because for now, here in this video, I want to talk about the success of getting unstuck and the recovery from anhedonia. And, well, I want to talk about two things. I want to share a bit of the process of how I got unstuck and what that felt like. But I also want to tell you why I consistently refer to predators as wolves in sheep's clothing. First of all, it's because that's how God frames them. So I want to talk about them the way our father does. He uses terms like wolves as well as goats and tares and darkness and light. But secondly, it's that it gets really confusing in the healing and recovery sphere. There's so many different categories and definitions. It's necessary for education and women need to get the knowledge of what's really happening and what you're really married to. Understanding all the differentiations is the best place to start. But what I've found is that there's so many women stuck there for years, stuck trying to figure out the abuser, analyzing him. He's a narcissist. No, wait, he might be a sociopath because he does this to me or he does that to me. And I've also seen that, but wait, he's got so many of those traits too. He might have an anti-social personality disorder, but wait, on and on it goes. The prey gets stuck analyzing the predator. I know I did. All my focus was on the wrong subject because I was in the wrong mode. Why did he do that to me? Why is he like that? Why, why, why? That's how we get stuck up in, inside our heads. We're already muddled up from being unhealed. But then on top of that, we're experiencing life in our weakest state. And we live in masculine mindset. It was God who showed me that it doesn't matter about the predator. You can't change that other person. 
It doesn't matter who they are, saved or not. It doesn't matter if they're a goat, a tear, or a wolf. That's their choice. So it doesn't matter why he is, what he is, and why he does what he does to you. I only needed to know that I didn't like how I was feeling. The emotions and feelings that I'd been experiencing and was experiencing more and more because they weren't getting better. The marriage was longer, but it wasn't getting any better. It was the same in all the functions and routines, but worse in the same areas. If you're crossing the street and a drunk driver runs a red light and hits you, does it really matter if he's driving a Ford or a Chevy? When you're in the ambulance, banged up and bleeding, barely conscious, do the medical people ask you about the truck that hit you? How fast was it going or what color was it? Do they question you? Didn't you look both ways before crossing the street or how could you not see that truck coming at you? It was so loud and fast. They don't ask you if he was drunk, what kind of alcohol he was drinking if he was drunk. No, they don't. They focus only on you because it's all about you. The variables about the driver, that offender, are irrelevant. When your husband manipulates, lies, and deceives you, when he coercively controls you, when he's angry at you more than he's not, when he's verbally abusive, has an affair, or is abusive in any other way, it doesn't matter why. The variables are irrelevant. You need to focus on you. You are the only medical attendant who can advocate for your heart, mind, and soul. That inner girl who needs all the focus to be on her so she can heal. That's one of the reasons I love Dr. Shaler, because she consistently refers to them as hijackles. That's it. That's the only word she uses. And by using just one word, it diffuses the whole idea into question that we ask. Why did they do that? How could they do that? When you change your direction of thinking and your line of questioning, your radar of detection narrows in on you. The answers become smaller and succinct and emotionally manageable for you, the victim. That's the beginning of your healing journey. When your focus shifts completely off the predator onto you, you know what you've done? You've just put a little distance between them and you. And when that object of focus is further away, there's more space for you. It's the beginning of your boundaries. They get a little further away from your soul and that makes their impact on your heart smaller. That shift from them to you makes them irrelevant just a little and so shifting my focus is what I had to do over and over and over again in order to rebuild myself from the anhedonia the more I shifted my focus away from the theft from the anhedonia which is really what happens they steal your personal joy from you the more I shifted the more I validated my heart the more space there was for me to heal and rebuild. It's humanly impossible to focus on him and you. And as long as you focus on him, you will always be the victim. So with that, let me share with you and encourage you that you can do it. It took me two years, but I can finally play the very song that Dean stole from me. It's called Angelfish and it's composed by Anne Crosby. The anhedonia was so deep in me that when I first started to practice, I could only practice three minutes at a time before I would feel triggered and nauseous. I would have to stop and work through the trauma and sometimes I'd even throw up from the emotional pain. I'd pull myself back together and sit back down at the piano for another three or four minutes until it happened again. It took me two years to increase my practice time from that three minutes to 45 minutes. Yes, I can now practice 45 minutes without any triggers. Along with Angelfish, I also learned a Christmas song. Now the backstory there is that I thought I didn't like the idea 
of interrupting my course learning to focus on a Christmas song. So I never stopped. I never stopped to learn any. But the truth is never the truth when it came to Dean. The truth was that he destroyed every special occasion in our house with some kind of drama. And for Christmas, which I loved everything about Christmas, so there was always some kind of big drama. And that always spilled over onto the kids' Christmas piano recital because we all loved it. But now I'm a different girl. And this year I did it. So I'd like to share that with you. But before I play, I want to thank every one of you for subscribing to my channel and to let you know that I do consider it a great privilege to be part of your healing journey in whatever capacity it is that you allow me to be. I wish you the ability to have the merriest Christmas that you can have within your own personal experiences and for you to know that whatever it is that you're experiencing, wherever you are on your healing journey, you are not alone. God is in it. Bye for now, and I'll see you in the next one. Closing thoughts. First, shh, don't say a word about this to him. Discovering that your husband's dangerous is a scary place to end up. It's never where you thought you'd be, and it feels like an unreality. But your silence about your awareness of what he really is, that's your safety zone. And always remember, a clueless guy that causes dysfunction and seems difficult, he's not dangerous. But the malignant man is not clueless. He just pretends to be difficult and dysfunctional. 
so that he can hide how dangerous he is.